now listening to Protecting Your Nest with Board Certified Family Medicine and Obesity Medicine Specialist, Dr. Tony Hampton. For more, visit drtonyhampton.com. Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Research has proven over and over again that in order to prevent and reverse medical illnesses, that lifestyle changes are the key. Those lifestyle changes include dietary changes as well as increased physical activity, a reduction of stress, improved sleep, among others. What's perplexing, however, is that in spite of the clear benefits of lifestyle medicine, it appears that most conventionally trained docs don't seem to be motivated to use this approach in their clinical practice. Today, I will introduce you to a doctor who is an outlier, an outlier who has shifted her entire medical practice to one where her focus is not medicines, but instead treating the root cause of her patient's illnesses and using lifestyle changes as her primary tool. Today's guest is Dr. Rashani Sanghani. Dr. Sanghani, before becoming, you know, going back to India, she was an American board certified endocrinologist. So she actually got some training right here in the good US of A. Her focus of her clinical practice eventually transitioned to the reversal of type 2 diabetes. And I did say reversal and reversing insulin resistance with lifestyle changes. And, and those entities that she used included low carb, making sure her patients had adequate protein, intermittent fasting making sure they had healthy fats. Yes, fat is a good thing. Uh, spirituality, self-care, and of course, mindfulness. And that mindfulness piece is what I really admire about her. She she works with her patients, uh, you know, kind of looking at their behavioral uh, health, their, their habits, and doing whatever she can to help them emotionally and psychologically to understand what's the root cause of their health issues. She also is a endocrinologist, so she focuses on hormone biology and, of course, metabolism. She believes, quote, that drugs cannot reverse chronic disease, but lifestyle changes can, unquote. So as her colleague, I approve this message, which is why I am so happy she will be joining us today. So with that, Doc, I am so happy to welcome you to Protecting Your Nest. Thank you, Tony, for having me on the show. Yeah, well, let me tell you, um, I can't believe that we worked in the same health system and we didn't know that we both had the same mindset about metabolic health. So, but but there's someone in the sky, there's a universe that has finally brought us together. Although I had to wait all the way until you were in India to do that. So thank God for technology. And uh, and one of the things I want to say before we get started is what we talked about before we uh, started recording. And by the way, guys, we recorded literally four video shorts on YouTube. So make sure you, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can check that out for those who are checking this out on the podcast app. But so I did a little bit of a, a, a search on Diet Doctor. I've written articles for the Diet Doctor. You've been interviewed. We've both been interviewed by the Diet Doctor, which is the number one low carb resource online and I typed in search for endocrinologists and in the world and and I only saw maybe one. I only saw one and it was an endocrinologist, Dr. Kavita in Australia. So we're gonna make sure that if there's some endocrinologists hidden somewhere in that database that we bring them to the forefront. But it does highlight the fact that our endocrinology colleagues may not be aware of the benefits of using lifestyle as the primary mo modality to treat these illnesses, particularly diabetes. So I think I'm so grateful that you're out there spreading this message. And that's why I wanted to bring you to the podcast. So let's, let's get started with my first question, just to kind of break the ice a little bit, you know, talk a little bit about, um, I know you are in India right now, and you started your journey in the United States in very familiar territory uh, uh, to me. So share where you grew up and how you ultimately ended up back in India. Thank you. Sure. So I've done the international move three times, actually. Wow. Yeah. So wow. I was born in Chicago. I grew up um, in Schaumburg. Oh, and cool. I was, yeah. 
And so I was there till I was 10. Mm. And then my family moved to India in the 80s when I was a 10 year old. And then from the age of 10 till completing my medical school, my undergrad, I was in Mumbai. Cool. And then I came back to Chicago for another 10 years. I did one year in Philadelphia for psychiatry residency. And then I switched back to internal medicine, which I did at Cook County. And then I was a chief resident at County for a year. And then I did my endocrinology fellowship at UIC. And then I worked at your system at Advocate Christ in Oak Lawn. And that was for two years in private practice. And then in 2011, we decided to move uh, move number three back to India. So although I am physically right now in India, I've been here for 12 years. Now, thanks to technology, we are practicing globally. Nice. Um, first of all, congrats for being the chief resident at one of the most challenging hospitals on the planet, uh, guys, Cook County Hospital. By the way, I was born at Cook County Hospital. Uh, by the way, when I was a medical st- uh, student, I did uh, dermatology there. I did pediatrics there. Infectious disease was insanity. Um, and it was just so much illness there, but you learned so much. So uh, nothing but respect for that. Christ Hospital, uh, where you worked, is only, I'm more of a outpatient doc, but it's like 10 minutes away from my clinic. So we were literally a few steps away from each other. So really great to kind of hear your foundation. And like when I first discovered you and realized you had these Chicago roots, it just blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute, this is crazy. So we got to make sure we connect with people and which is why we like diet doctrine, low carb USA, et cetera, that's trying to do that work. So now when I hear you speak, it's clear that you I hear a lot of American accent in your voice, right? But you're now in India. And so when you went back to India, having spent 10 years of your early years in the United States, you know, what was the, did that create any barriers uh, in terms of how people related to you when you went back? Yes, um, it does initially. Uh, although because I had come to India when I was 10, that's apparently an age where you can pick up multiple accents. Mm. So I developed this knack for if I was talking to someone from India, I would talk with a thick Indian accent. And then if someone from Chicago shows up or someone from New York shows up or anywhere, American, I would switch to the American accent. This wasn't willful or conscious. It was unconscious. I wasn't aware that I was doing that. And now that I'm in my mid forties and beyond, My brain is probably finding it harder to keep switching accents. Mm. I think my accent has gotten a bit locked in place. So one interview I did in India, you know, in the YouTube comments, people on the internet can be mean. So somebody Mm. said, oh, she's got such a fake accent. It's okay. It's the internet. You know, I'm not even aware of it. But now my girls, my two children, because I talk to them with this mishmash accent, it's not fully Indian and it's not fully U.S., so they pick up certain words and, you know, go to school. And it's it's funny. I think the internet now exposes you and everybody hears it. So no barrier. It's probably appreciated. <laughs> yeah, I I relate to that. I think about my wife. Uh, my wife's name is Karan and she's a pharmacist for Walmart, but she is from uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And um, a lot of the early days of her life she was raised by her grandmother mom was in school dad was on the road as a truck driver and and I tell you man when she's on the phone talking to those relatives oh my god it's like the country literally comes out it's like you can hear it and it's just so it's amazing how the brain works just like with languages how you can switch your brain my my oldest son speaks very fluent Spanish and he just goes back and forth like it's you know seamless so that that all makes sense but I was just curious because I have um, a couple of, have three who are internal medicine in my department. We have about 12 clinicians, really 13. And the two, one of the three, uh, it has a more American accent and two of the three don't. And and I was just curious what that would feel like, you know, with you having gone. So thank you for that. I just wanted to throw a little culture into the mix. And one more thing about uh, your hometown is um, just comparing the United States to India. I have not traveled to India yet. I'm looking forward to it. But when you think about the contrast since you've been in both worlds, what 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 stands out in your mind in terms of how they're different? 
Oh, so many. I think if I speak in terms of di diabetes management, right, mm -hmm. or in terms of lifestyle yes. for health, yeah, um, in that sense, I can pick up some top differences. One is Indian homes still cook. They cook a lot. They cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner in most homes wow. from scratch. Wow. Yeah. So it's not a lot of frozen or grab and go type of uh, behavior. It's probably too expensive for most people to buy that kind of food. And maybe now we have a bit of like instant noodles or like instant, you know, small items, but a whole microwave dinner. No, mm -hmm. where you will see people sending hot lunches or home cook, get people get up in the morning at five to cook fresh lunches, which will go with the kids or go with the office going members of the home to the office, you know? Um, so Cooking three times a day is very normal. That's yeah. one big difference. Yeah. I, I like um, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very big thing. It's, we use it to the put for the positive. We take advantage yeah. of that. Yeah. The other thing we take advantage of is because we have such a large population, a lot of people can afford some help in the house. Um, and it's good for the economy because somebody wants to make that money mm. and come into your house and help with chopping with cooking with cleaning every day and it's a part-time system where people come they cook they clean they go um and so we have this moving sort of help arrangement with a lot of homes um yes there are definitely the middle class that's rising a lot of you know both couple people are working and so they do rely on that is to take help um so that you can keep cooking I wasn't expecting that answer, but uh, my wife would be happy. She she doesn't mind cooking, but having a little help every once in a while wouldn't be a bad thing because we're busy. Yeah, we're busy pharmacist. I'm a busy doctor, and yeah, although air fryers and things like that make things quick, it's nice yeah. to know that there's somebody available to kind of support that. So that's very interesting. Wasn't expecting that second answer at all. So before we kind of dive into why people tend to come to this podcast, which is talking about, you know, lifestyle and the things like that. I want to circle back about uh, Cook County Hospital. Uh, I have some amazing memories from there uh, during rotations there. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, when I was there, uh, many of my attendings had a, uh, were from India. Uh, so that was very, so I had a chance to learn the culture in that setting. Uh, but I also... Uh, just have, like, I remember um, a memory where we had to uh, draw blood and we were so concerned that the tube system would lose the sample that we literally had to literally take it to the lab ourselves. <laughs> and, and there were times when we got some feedback while we were waiting about, is this a gram positive? Now, you know, just so we would know, because somebody was so sick, we were very concerned. So Cook County is a very unique place, probably the most uh, intense place I've ever trained. So I want to just want you to circle back any memories of that great hospital. I know they call it uh, Stroger's Hospital now, but um, yeah, any true. any memories about the hospital that uh, stand out in your mind? I love county. I loved all my time at county. Uh, yes, it's Stroger, but we go with the the the, the loving name of Cook County, right. right? We call that's it right. county. Yeah, and uh, um, I I met some really smart people there. Uh, county is a place that is very open to receiving foreign medical graduates, yes. which makes it easy because I had finished medical school in India. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, so many like me who have studied and. You know, we do pretty well on the USMLEs and smart doctors, not only people who scored high, there were people who had finished residencies in their countries, three mm -hmm. years of internal medicine, and were reapplying to get that clean break in America yeah. and start again as an intern in internal medicine and do three more years. And such smart, humble doctors. So That's I was right. surrounded by smart and everybody was just textbooks walking around, you know humble, honest, hardworking physicians from countries all over the world. I got to meet people from so many other countries. Um, one of the things I love about my time there was the teaching environment mm -hmm. uh, was very, what I call first, you know, engineers call first principles thinking is break it down to its first principles is, you know, one of our attendings, he's still there. Uh, and I'm still in touch with some of my best teachers from there. I think I've learned so much 
is a post call. You're on rounds. You've admitted a lot of people overnight and it's 7 a.m. and you're doing post call rounds and you have to explain to the senior attending what your plan is for this patient. What are you going to do to help them get out discharged on good feet? And they, I would say, we're going to just order the standard labs and he would stop you. He's like, what do you mean standard labs? Every patient is different. Every patient has a different symptom, a different list of diseases you're thinking about. So each blood test you order, don't just take it for granted and throw in 16 different tests because it's a click of a button. You need to justify why you want all these tests. And that just made us vigilant is be mindful of how you're prescribing, how you're ordering, how you're conveying your thoughts to people. Don't just order everything to see what lands up on the table. You know, sometimes we do that if we don't know what we're looking for. Right. And it's very good training. Um, and, uh, you know, it was it was a very academically challenging environment because of the pressure. And yet I would say that when you've come from medical school in India, we trained in the municipal hospitals, the public hospitals. So the same way what county is to Chicago, where it's the underinsured, it's mm -hmm. the, you know, um, people who it's their last resort because they can't go to private hospitals. It's mm -hmm. government funded, you know, care. Those kinds of places are where we trained in India as well. But India and America, what is what is considered low income, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So the resources in the training hospitals was so different. It, it was air conditioning everywhere. You have the option of ordering. I remember this was so you know uh, prominent in my head was if I had to order a coagulation profile during my med school days, I had to like take the stuff and go to some other building and we would wait three days for some result to come back. It was like a send out type of thing. And here I come, I land and they were doing post call and the resident senior to me, he's like, I'll order this. I'll do a mixing study and I'll get to know if there's something in the in the serum that's causing this clotting problem. It's like, wait, that's going to take forever. He's like, oh, well, we'll have it by afternoon yeah. in-house. So the resources, you know, so wow. Stroger was a government place, but it was resourced to give excellent care. Yeah. And when you look at the new, because they actually uh, tore down the old version or they they re, they did something to it. They did. Um, yeah. Version, right. And now we have a new version. So it's even not, uh, I went there for a uh, conference uh, or a meeting. It was a meeting. Actually, we were meeting one of the doctors. We were because I'm the medical director for something called Food Smart. And sometimes we and it's an app that helps people with nutrition and and coaching and we were meeting one of the leaders there and uh it's a nice building now it's very slick looking so uh and i and i think about what you said about um you know just uh this this ideal of you know the underserved so i'm so happy that we're starting to focus on health equity um in our country and hopefully in india as well where we're saying hey everybody didn't start off the same. They may need extra help. So I think the work of health equity has been done by Cook County for years, but now it's yes. starting to spread to other health systems like ours, uh, at least the one we both had and previously belonged to and belong to now, which is Advocate Health. The other thing I, that you gave me a flashback about was these brilliant doctors coming to the, U the US. And when I was in my training, I did something called the Maternal Child Health Fellowship. And in that fellowship, I did uh, C-sections, tubules, DNCs, procedures, but guess who were my assistants? My assistants were these doctors who already were surgeons in their country who had to come back to the United States and kind of, and in this case, they're not even a residency. They're just literally working as uh, surgical assistants because they were having trouble to uh, become surgeons in this country. So my surgical assistant was a surgeon who had more experience than I had. I mean, oh just imagine that. So, so I think uh, how we leverage and and benefit from uh, others needs to be rethought. And 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 just because we really, I think we don't have enough doctors. I remember when we first started. I told you, just getting a referral to endocrinologists is very difficult. I mean, we're mm -hmm. always struggling to find professionals, yet they're there, and we don't leverage that like we should. So, I think we can do a better job. But thank you for sharing your experience at county. Now we'll dive a little bit into the whole medical piece. And we want I want to start with the hormones. I wanted to know a little bit about everything. So I became a family doctor, right? Just yeah. enough about everything. But you decided to go into the hormone uh, specialty. So what made you want to go into that area? Oh, 
So I've always liked the mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. And what better way than to study the hormones? Because you could think something stressful and your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, your brain and your mind thinks about it, responds to stress, and it's no longer a tiger in the jungle, right? It's now promotions, it's retirement, it's my future of my kids, it's all these past, present, future things that we're stressing about. So th the influence of thought on body was happening through hormones. Mm -hmm. The other thing I loved about hormones was the brain talks to the lung, talks to the kidney, talks to the heart, the skin talks to the muscle, the muscle talks to the bone, the bone talks to the muscle talks to brain. Everybody's talking to each other. It's all hormones. And so it seems like a very well-run office. Everybody, all the departments are always in touch with each other, you know? So that's happening through hormones. And so I loved it. I was like, wow, that's a little bit of everything. So I felt like hormones would give me a little bit of everything. Yeah. Uh, and you're right. Uh, again, I we talked about interconnectedness of your body when I did my functional medicine training. And um, of the things that interconnect us, hormones, it makes, you know, kind of at the top of the list. So it does make sense to think about that principle. But even bigger is if we understand that everything is connected, when you're trying to understand the root cause of illness, you can't just focus on an organ. You have to focus on the other things that impact that organ. So that's so, so as we kind of heal and learn how to heal, we have to say, you keep peeling the onion. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? And you just keep peeling until you get to the root cause and then you can heal. And then you won't be married to medicine for the rest of your life because you'll have, your body will say, I got this. I just needed a yeah. little help to, <laughs> to, to get mm -hmm. me to where we are. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about you being an endocrinologist, uh, and as you know, in the low carb community, we finally have had uh, plant-based uh, speakers at Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners Conference, once called Low Carb USA. So they, and reason why they changed it from Low Carb USA Conference to Metabolic Health Symposium is because they recognize there's more than one way to heal. Doesn't have to be <laughs> carnivore, right? You can actually do some other stuff. So- but there's still people in the low carb community that just don't believe that a plant-based dietary pattern can uh, get the job done. Uh, so when you think about um, um, that approach, right? Um, how do you, uh, when you're dealing with patients who have uh, plant-based uh, dietary patterns, I think maybe you have a plant-based dietary pattern, right? So how do you navigate that in a way that allows people to still achieve their goal. Yeah, that's a great one. I would love to talk about that. So I'm not all the way plant-based. I, uh -huh. I still eat eggs. Okay. Um, I, I still eat eggs because I really do need the protein and I, I decided to give up dairy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm vegetarian, uh, but ovo vegetarian, not lacto ovo. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many different ways of defining ourselves now. Um, and but there are people who are plant based. I would say that the majority of people I work with in India or across the world, Indians of Indian origin across the world, they are the lacto vegetarians. So mm -hmm. they are OK yeah. taking milk products. Mm -hmm. um, um, they might be less OK taking eggs, um, but then the rest of it becomes plant based. So the only so some so you could decide, you know, from the animals, but some of them will be OK with dairy. Some of them will be OK with eggs. But they, if they call themselves vegetarian in the Indian context, it's no fish, no poultry, no red meat. Mm, okay. Um, so the big challenge then becomes protein. How are you going to get the right. protein to target? You know. So as long as we don't get political about it, has to be carnivore. It has to right, be plant based. Right. That's right. You know. I think what we all agree on, and we should agree on, is protein. Is it needs to get to target. You can't be protein malnourished and get anywhere. Yeah, and a diet doctor. Um... When I talked to Dr. Andrea Seinfeld, who started it, he said they're, you know, they're doing the satiety thing, but even before mm -hmm. they did satiety as a focus with their separate uh, website, uh, it was all about protein. And and that's such an essential macronutrient. I think that's really important to message. Um, I do want to think about my endocrinology colleagues like yourself who uh, are 
they seem to be more medicine centric. Uh, one of my pet peeves these days is uh, Jardius um, because, yeah. Jard, you know, because it's like, okay, we're going to tell you to, you know, urinate out the glucose instead of focusing on not consuming things that turn into glucose. It, it drives me nuts. And of the specialists that my patients see and they come back with that prescription, it's cardiology and endocrinology, right? So yeah. I'm not suggesting yeah. the drug doesn't have value. This 500, at least in the US, it's a $500 drug. It only reduces your A1C when you look it up by maybe 0.8 instead of a point. And it just drives me crazy. So I just want to hear your thoughts on why you think the specialty of endocrinology and of course others have not embraced lifestyle changes as the primary tool to treat, treat patients. Yeah. And I think for that, they, whoever's listening should definitely go watch that shorts video about the guidelines, how we talk yes. about the consensus guidelines and what that does to doctors' brains. Um, but to answer right here for the endocrine uh, aspect, um, I'll tell you another story here, which is very important for any, any patient who wants to talk to their endocrinologist or any endocrinologist who's listening right now. I don't know how many people remember this, but in 2002, the New England Journal of Medicine came out with the DPP study. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? It's a gospel It's a gospel study for anybody who believes in lifestyle medicine. But mm -hmm. I wanna put it out here today for someone who's hearing that study for the first time. I'll, I'll summarize it in brief, okay, for anybody, or if you never heard it, let's tell you for the first time. The US government funded this study it's the first and probably the last time that you would have seen a three year long study looking at lifestyle change versus medication. That's literally what the study was. That's right. And who were they studying this on? On people with prediabetes. More than 3,000 people with prediabetes, fasting glucose above 100, but not high enough to be in the diabetes range. And same with the A1C. It was above normal, but it wasn't fully diabetes. They took these people, 3,000 of them, and divided them into three groups. One group got nothing at all. Just go keep living your life. One group got 850 milligrams of metformin twice a day, which is the, the right drug to start with. It's, it helps your body respond better to insulin. And the third group got lifestyle modification. What did the lifestyle group get? A good support for losing 7% body weight through lifestyle you know, diet change and things, and 150 minutes of activity a week. In three years, and 45%, this matters for you and me, Tony, 45% of those 3,000 people were from minority groups. Okay? Huge. Yeah, huge. Now, guess what happened? The, the lifestyle modification group had 58% less new cases of diabetes compared to placebo. 58. All right? right. Compared to doing nothing, if you do lifestyle you prevented 58% less cases. Metformin, the diabetes drug, prevented 31% compared right. to doing nothing at all. So pretty strong, very impressive. But 58 versus 31, that's almost double. Mm. It's Where lifestyle double. change, it's literally <laughs> almost, it's almost like 60-30. That's right. So almost twice as strong it is if you do that 7% weight loss and 150 minutes. Now, my pet peeve, and, and there's another powerful statement that comes from this study. To prevent one case of diabetes, seven people need to make lifestyle change, and one out of those seven will not get diabetes. So you need to give lifestyle change to seven people to prevent one. Yeah. If you use the metformin approach, you need to give metformin to 14 people to prevent one case. Yeah. Double. Okay? Now, that's metformin, which is cheap. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it gets nasty, is... After the HbA1c becomes 6.5 or 7, whichever is your magic number, this DPP study, which shows you that lifestyle change is more powerful, we somehow have amnesia about that. It's the same disease. When you go from an HbA1c of 6.4 to 7.4, it's the same exact disease, That's but right. worse. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Right. But we forget that lifestyle change is twice as powerful, and we jump into this prescription algorithm where the drugs are so expensive. And they don't cure anything. They don't reverse anything. And people can watch that guideline, you know, video of ours. Um, and I think it's just 
terrible amnesia that we don't know about this study when we're thinking about what disease are we treating. So my question to endocrine colleagues or doctors listening is ask yourself when you s deal with diabetes, and it's not easy. I mean, oh, yeah. learning to actually manage diabetes and prescribe in a in a 15 minute visit where insurance companies want you to do something, your hospital bosses want you to do something and billing has to be of a certain type and you have to meet all these prescription targets. It's It's terrible. But if you want to do the hard work, I would ask you to ask yourself, did you get into healthcare? These are not easy questions. Did you get into healthcare to reduce healthcare costs? Okay. Did you get into healthcare to prescribe more drugs? Or did you get into healthcare to help people heal? Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. <laughs> so it's um, not easy, but it's. It's and 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 I know a lot about that study because we have a diabetes prevention program. That's what the DPP means, guys, um, in our health system. And I was fortunate to help lead that in the South region. Now, now what I also remember, and I have to throw this out because so many of my patients are older. My recollection is that for those, I think over sixty-five, it was seventy-one percent. Oh. Can you believe that? Yeah. So for, for oh. those over that age, so so for the and the, the people who are gonna not change, um, it is what it is. No, they had even more success on uh using a, a program like this. Now, in my opinion, we talked about this earlier. Why are people being successful other than the obvious because lifestyle, you're getting to the root cause of what caused the problem in the first place, because these programs also provide support. And and not not just from us and not just from the coach who leads the group. We may just show up as a doctor and do a you know a lecture. It's it's the they support each other. So oh uh oh baby, I hadn't tried that mac and cheese cauliflower recipe. It, it tastes good. And then they share recipes, they they're accountable to each other. At the end of the day, can we invest in that type of resource instead of putting more medicine in people's mouths, which doesn't get to the root cause, doesn't really solve the problem. And I don't want to have a 0.8 A1C reduction with a $500 a month medicine when I could have just changed my diet. So I really appreciate your framing. Another thing we should say to our colleagues, and I'll let you speak to this, is, um, you know, again, lifestyle is important, but a lot of people are afraid. Uh, and some of that fear is because they didn't know about the study. But maybe that fear is also because some they don't think the organizations endorse. So could you just speak a little bit about what is out there in terms of organizational endorsements that this low carb dietary approach is actually okay? Oh, it's been in print since 2019 in the American Diabetes Association fine print. It's not in the colorful printed algorithm. It never is in the arrow arrow page. Okay, it's in the fine print where it says in very technical jargon, it says it officially. For people whose diabetes is out of control, I'm paraphrasing, for people whose diabetes is out of control, if they want better glucose levels with less medication, low carb is a viable option. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And that sentence, that sentence has been there 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23. It hasn't gone away. That's amazing. So now we can give permission to our colleagues who are expected to follow guidelines and yes. recommendations. And of course, the American Heart Association joined in uh, later on in the uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinology. They all are saying low carb is a viable option. And, and by the way, and I've said this many times before when the American Heart Association put it out there, they said, asterisk, be careful if you're doing very low carb. Because very low carb, you know why they said that? No. Because it's so effective that you have to have guidance. <laughs> you need a clinician, <laughs> you need a doctor like myself and my colleague here to make sure you don't have hypoglycemia. And it was the yeah. only dietary pattern, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I send that to you, um, is the only dietary pattern where they had to make that statement. And that only translate into English to say, is yeah. the one that's the most effective. You you yes. want a diet that's going to make your sugars plummet. You just got to do it safely so you can get off your medicine. What what you don't exactly. want to do is stay on the medicine while your sugars are going to normal. So it's really so for those my colleagues out there who 
are not aware of this, we'll we'll try to have a link in the notes of the video so that people can look at these documents and feel comfortable that they're not outliers. Nobody wants to put their license at risk. You don't have to worry about that with low carb or keto anymore. And we're working on the research on carnivore. So thank you so much for that. Now, you you also are unique in that you trained as a person, a, di- a diabetic educator, and you're a trainer. Uh, so I want you to speak to that a little bit because I want to understand how that type of training has helped you. Because sometimes the di- diabetes training can give a, an opinion that's a little contrary to what we believe, but but I'm sure there's other benefits. Uh, just like when I got my master's in nutrition, uh, they weren't completely saying carnivore is okay, but 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 the the education itself, rather it's the biochemistry or us challenging each other was really powerful. So what was your experience with that? Oh, the biggest, and I don't think I would be where I am today. You know, I would have still been a, a fairly useless you know, standard doctor, if I had not done those extra (laughs) trainings is I would still, there was a high chance without those trainings, I might've wanted to do something different, but I would have been handicapped. I wouldn't have known how to do lifestyle management with my patients because I had no ability um, and I had no tools. So what, and no way of thinking about it. So I would definitely say that I went out of my way to add more tools to my skill set. I was a good prescriber of drugs. I knew all about that. But what these other certifications gave me were multifaceted thinking for the same client is, first of all, the educator thing that worked for me the both the most was instead of the attitude where the patient has to listen to what the doctor is telling them to do, which we call compliance, mm. is, is this a compliant patient or a non-compliant patient? Like, are they doing as I say or not? Which I used to think that's rude to think like that, but I didn't know there's a better way of doing it until I read the educator books where it says it's about patient empowerment. Mm. Is Can I educate and empower this person with their options, trusting that they anyway want to do well so they will get to decide what's right for them with their life once they walk out of your office. They have so much going on that only they know about. So if you give them the right information and respect, you can trust that they might do something different. Um, so that's what I got from the educator approach. And that's where the, that, that was the first time. So 2011 is where I heard for the first time that reducing carbs would would do something to um, you know a, a person's health, except it, it's interesting how we get compartmentalized where we're like, oh, if I could use this for type one diabetes, why can't I use this for type two or for lifestyle? And there were two things there. One was measuring C-peptide, which I do when I'm thinking about type one, but I wasn't doing it for type two. Mm-hmm. Or for type one diabetes management, I was doing insulin to carbohydrate ratio counting, where we would tell patients, because your pancreas is not giving you insulin, we have to count. So if you have 15 grams of carbohydrate, you need this much insulin. So no surprise, if you take more carbs, you need more insulin. It was obvious when you were treating someone with type one, but that intelligence did not switch over Mm -hmm. to the lifestyle world, even though we knew it in type one. So a lot of things sort of collided together over the years. Um, the, The personal trainer thing became important because as I came back to India, I decided to, so that I could reconnect with my people, I did the education myself. I didn't want to refer it out where I say, go to the educator. And then I don't know what happens with them. I'm still I just kept, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And it's so much more fun. And so yeah. I would keep the patient with me and do the education across my table. And then we would talk about prescriptions. And through that, I heard lots of reasons why people in India don't exercise. They'll say they have cervical spondylosis. They'll say they have a hernia or a cesarean section and all these things that I knew nothing about uh, counteracting it with better advice. I was like, oh, oh, you can't exercise with a hernia. I didn't know that. I don't know what, why that is. And I would feel stupid. So I went and I got the knowledge of what it is to exercise with all these different limitations so that I could prescribe exercise and push people past their plateau and things like that. Yeah, uh, it's always cool. And I encourage anybody checking this out. Like when I, I this is a completely separate thing, but I think about the steak and butter gal, Bella, and how she plays the piano in some of her videos to show that 
talent, right? So even a talent that completely has nothing to do with what we're talking about, she brings it to her videos. And so whatever gift you have, uh, whatever life experience you have, bring it to your job, bring it to your YouTube channel, bring it to uh, the world so that they can benefit. And I, you have to integrate. And there's always a way. You have to be a little creative sometimes to integrate it. So I really appreciate you. And again, I, I like the idea that the training didn't, it wasn't the details of how to manage diabetes. It was how you think about the person in front of you and yeah. remove those barriers. And that's, and, and if, if clinicians don't take the time to do that, they miss an opportunity to help a person who who wants to be helped. Very few people don't want to be helped. Very few people don't want to be healthy and be here with their family. So thank you for that. Um, I am curious, are there, uh, are you really a unicorn or are there other people in India? <laughs> I'm sorry to describe you that way. Who, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who, who literally have a similar model. I mean, how unique is this metabolic health clinic model in the circle that you're around? Mm. Um, the good news is there are more diabetes reversal startups happening in India now. So that's okay. a great thing. Okay. There are more lifestyle-based clinics coming up now. Okay. And there are endocrinologists involved. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. How deep have they been in it? Um, I think this is all sort of accelerated in, I've seen a lot of these startups come in the last probably three, four years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good thing. So word on this, and there are, there are people, I shouldn't take away from people who have been doing this for longer. There are a couple of organizations that have been doing a plant-based reversal or an intermittent fasting based reversal, even before these, you know, VC funded startups have come. So there were clinicians from various walks of life who have been doing their own version of lifestyle change yeah. for, for diabetes yeah. reversal. It, it exists for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now that with VC funding, the good thing is it's everywhere. There's advertising happening. There's marketing happening where, you know, you, you'll laugh at these numbers, but they'll say, oh, do you want diabetes reversal? Call now for a, a, a doctor consultation. And it'll say like some low cost in Indian rupees and then they'll slash it and then it'll say free. Or they'll say 99 rupees, which is less than $2 mm. for a doctor consult. Wow. So uh, now I don't know what sort of doctor is going to be on the other end of that connect but at least the eyeballs you know the viewers the people the masses of india are getting this advertising message is guess what diabetes reversal is a thing yeah and it's uh even when i wrote my book fix your diet fix your diabetes um your dietary solution to reversing uh type 2 diabetes uh me and the uh, editor were going back and forth about reversal can you put that on the you know, on the, on the, yeah, on the, on the cover. And I was like, well, I'm going to, <laughs> because <laughs> I think we need to see that. And just like me and my wife have talked about, should you really be a low carb keto or carnivore doctor? Should you say metabolic health? I said, I got to say metabolic health, just like the society, because we have to socialize these terms so that people mm -hmm. are, are hearing it. And it's not just a YouTube video that's giving this information. It should be in a clinic. And I have good news for you in terms of advocate health. We, and at least in the Illinois market, we are, it's novel, but we are creating metabolic health clinics uh, with the, in the cardiology realm. Can you believe that? So, so it's all new. Fantastic. We haven't started them yet. It'll probably be next year, but it is. I haven't, you know, we're, I'm not you know, leading that. You would think so, right? But what I'm doing mm -hmm. is I'm going to certainly involve myself and make sure that what their interpretation of that is consistent, but but absolutely excited that people are recognizing that that's important. The key is it's a team sport and you can't do good metabolic health just by having a great doctor. You really got to have no. a great pharmacist, a great nurse, a great medical assistant, uh, a behavioral health specialist, a coach. You need all of that stuff to make this work. So so yes. let's, let's really quickly um, just speak to uh, you, we, we really are talking about diet and, and as a trainer, uh, talking about the, um, the, uh, exercise, but what other modalities, um, that do, do you advise patients to take on as they are healing metabolically? What are the things that they need to think about? Yeah. So we covered the first two, which was nutrition and exercise. 
Um, but I go in a certain order is I work with them first on, and I have a team who helps me as well. Cause this is not, like you said, it's not a one person job at all. No. So we start with nutrition first. We then uh, in parallel, then start talking about sleep. Mm-hmm. And the reason I go in that order is as you fix your food and your sleep, you start waking up with more energy. You start starting your day with just more energy, just by fixing nutrition and sleep. Mm-hmm. Once you have more energy, your mood tends to get better. And so the third bucket is stress. So nutrition, it's like your nest word. I just, I don't have the same flow, but it's the same words. Is nutrition, sleep, Mm -hmm. stress management gets better. And once all those three are moving forward, then you'll feel motivated to exercise. Mm. So I think it's too much too fast when the person comes in and you say, do diet and exercise and go, go off you go. It's just too awkward. You know, there's like, you have to massage it up and build up the momentum to get to exercise. And so nutrition, then sleep, then stress, then exercise. And only when I've invested sufficiently in exercise that we won't go for sarcopenia, then we go to fasting. Because mm. I cannot have my vegetarian protein deficient Indians not strength train and lose muscle when they fast. That's right, and and thank you for uh, emphasizing that. And again, uh, I really want to live in a world where we honor those different dietary patterns. Certainly, you had to when you went back to yeah. India because there's going to be a whole lot of plant based folk. And for anybody out there who really believes low carb keto and carnivore is the is the is you know is the thing of magical things really understand from today's conversation that you can absolutely do it with a more plant lean you just have to be guided in a way that'll help that uh happen so really appreciate that um now uh when it comes to culture right um the culture um has certain types of foods that are specific to culture. (laughs) So when you're talking to patients in that environment that you're in there, I mean, I think every culture has starchy foods, right? Things that raise blood sugar. How are you managing that with your patients and and what types of things are you asking them to kind of cut back on? Yeah, sure. So again, the person walking in probably hasn't studied nutrition or biology Mm -hmm. in 15, 20 years, right? Um, So when you say cut carbs, increase protein, they have no idea what you're talking about. Right, right. Right. So, um, you know, and and some of my, if, if I've just hired a nutritionist or a dietitian, they may say, oh, they might start talking in grams, but people don't know grams of protein. They don't talk like that. They talk in terms of platefuls or bowlfuls or spoonfuls of stuff, right? That's the way you put food in your mouth. <laughs> and so we we need to talk in their language. And what I do is I give them a list of here are the common Indian or your culture appropriate protein sources. And I want you to look at your protein sources And I want you to, and then of course we do the diet assessment and we do the recall and they use my app. And so I can see how much they're getting. I can see that they're protein deficient. They're not getting around 1.2 grams the way I want them to, 1.2 grams per kg body weight of protein. So I'm like, you have enough room to take all these protein sources and double them. Mm -hmm. Vegetables, you know, Indians do eat vegetables. They sometimes make it too spicy. So we talk to them about that is because we want them to double up on their vegetables. And the reason I do that is because, again, I'm trying to reduce habit friction. What, so what's mm-hmm. habit friction is if I just say just change everything overnight, it's too much too fast. But if we say the exact same menu that you have in your house, let's say it's this item A plus B, or I'll give you an example. If it's roti, which is Indian flatbreads plus dal, Mm-hmm. plus vegetables. Dal is the Indian lentils or pulses and legumes. So I'll tell them your dal and your vegetables, can you double them? Mm-hmm. Instead of one bowl of each, can you make it two? It's already being cooked by your house. So can you double it? Same menu. And the flatbread or the rice, your starchy thing, we give them that list. We're like, all these are your starches. Can you cut that to half? And only cut it to half When you've had these double items, the protein and the veg, because you're going to be full. So once you're full, you're not going to need the other stuff as much. Right. Yeah. That's a nice tricky way to do it. (laughs) You got to trick them. Yeah. You got to trick them. Yeah. Because I I, I do the same thing in terms of like, let's, you know, and of course I'm thinking animal based, but 
you know, yeah. let's eat the protein first. Let's eat the yeah. let's eat the the protein rather it's plant based or animal based. Got to eat that stuff first, and then in many cases you'll not really have a lot of room, or you'll you'll just be in a much better position to minimize the things that cause harm. So I appreciate that as well. And you know, one more quick question. Uh, I'm so so proud of Michelle Hearn. Uh, nutritionist, and many people in the low carb community know who she is. You're shaking your head. So, and she wrote the book, uh, The Fox Family Food Fight. And um, I, I I bring this up, number one, because she don't know it yet. And she'll probably hear from somebody. I'm going to make a video short highlighting that book because I think it's so important that we take care of our babies, right? Yeah. And she wrote this book to give our babies, our children, uh, the understanding of everything we're talking about today, the importance of metabolic health. So why not start with our children? So for those who have not heard of that book, I'll have a link in the notes. Uh, it's a great, uh, uh, beautifully illustrated book for our kids. And I wanted to put that out there. I'm not sure if there's ever been a book done like that, uh, that focuses on metabolic health. Now, having said that, when you think about what we're talking about, you know, when you think about the children of the world, like how important is it that they learn this message early on so that they won't suffer from these so-called chronic medical conditions later on. Oh yeah. It's absolutely crucial, you know, and I look back, you know, I guess you get a bit philosophical as you get more gray hair yeah. and you realize there were certain life skills that we did not learn in our childhoods. And they centered around three main buckets. We did not grow up learning how to manage our health, mm -hmm. our relationships and our money. Ooh. We learned history, geography, physics, chemistry, biology, math, and English, Spanish. Ooh. But did we get learned? Did we get taught in school how to manage health, nope. relationships, or money? Nope. No. And those are the things we all fall into trouble in in our 30s and 40s. Hmm. But maybe sooner, maybe later. That's but right. so teaching people how to eat in this food marketed world where we, you know, and at Low Carb Denver, Bill Schindler um, talks about. Uh, the domesticated ape, and he talks about our ancestral diets and how we're so disconnected from our our ancestral food patterns. So uh, food's being marketed to us. So mm -hmm. children are going to be disconnected from healthy eating unless the parents and communities step in and and undo those messages. For sure, I I am I'm I'm amazed. Um, I'll tell you this. You, you mentioned a few things um, that I actually just did. I, I went to the uh, online compounding in, interest calculator. I did this with my kids. So if you take a 20-year-old uh, who's going to retire at 65, and this is the money part you spoke of, if they, if they just save uh, $100 a month in a uh, S&P 500 uh, stock uh, uh, you know, program, um, they will, um, that'll, when they retire 65, it'd be 1.3 million. <laughs> Seriously. If only, if only I mean, we if did somebody that. told her, if you tell a 20 year old, yeah. you'll be a millionaire just by saving the money. hundred dollars. Starbucks. Right. A hundred dollars a month. Yeah. So why yeah. don't we teach this to our babies? Why don't we? And if I had known, who doesn't want a million dollars in the bank? And guess what? When you leave this and if you just live off the interest and you leave this place one day and you will. Then you, yeah. you can transition it, put it in a trust and give it to the next generation. Why don't they teach yeah. it? This? It's insane. They don't. And why yeah. don't people know? One of the resources uh, me and my wife use is Dr. John Gottman, who, who wrote the book, The uh, Principles of Marriage. But he did the actual research on him and his wife on marriage. And it, this is a great book. You know, many of us have heard of the five love languages. But if, yes. if, you, if there's research on relationships out there, why doesn't everybody have that information? And of course, health. Uh, why don't doctors know about nutrition? You know, we we have to do better. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, we have to. We have. It I mean, is. Dr. I mean, think about Dr. Georgia E. She had to leave Harvard as a psychiatrist yeah. because they said you can't talk about nutrition. Really? Yeah. Is that what we're yeah. going to do with Dr. Georgia E., which is the primary tool she uses to heal people? And we're going to tell her she can't <laughs> talk about nutrition. So, yeah. so the sort of world's broke, but. 
but it's okay because we're here to help fix it. And <laughs> I appreciate that you're here with me. So let's kind of wrap up with my usual uh, nest and rope acronym question, which is how you plan to protect your next nest over the next um the next, you know, year or so, what's going to, what are you going to add? I was just talking to my wife about exercise. I think I got a little jealous of Dr. Anthony Chafee or something. I was like, I need to work on, you know, a little, you know, build some, you know, so maybe that's what I'm thinking, but, but I really want to, uh, I do exercise Dr. Ben Bokikio's, uh, thing, yeah. every, you know, but I want to, I may want to just get a little bit more focused. So what are you, what are you going to do for uh, the next year or so? So I am, I love exercise and I like to sort of walk the talk. Um, what's happening right now is I'm writing my own book on diabetes reversal, lifestyle change for diabetes reversal. Nice. And even, yeah, and even someone with type one can benefit from those lifestyle changes. They can't get off the insulin, but they can still be on they less. They can have normal lump. They won't have yeah. all that variability. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. So I agree yeah. 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 So because of the book, and I'm I'm still a doctor. I'm still a mother. I'm still you know a family person. I've got a life to live. Uh, so the book is is eating into my exercise rhythm. Um, so <laughs> so it's funny that you said Dr. Ben Bokikio because guess whose book ah, I have? Ah, that's <laughs> funny. You got it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a gift. We'll have a link to that book because it's so easy to do that. I'm it's happy so to engage. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm doing his thing because it's so appealing to do 15 minutes. That's right. And I, I got greedy is, oh, it's only 15 minutes, but he needs you to do it twice a week. But now right. that I'm like, it's so good. I'm doing it like every 10 days. Nice. And so I can see that I'm losing muscle. Oh, already. you notice. Yeah. It'll, yeah, yeah. Like, Whenever I slack up, you can feel it. Yeah. 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 We're, we're in our, I'm, I'm 46, you know, so if I don't exercise, I'm going to lose muscle in about 10 days. It's going <laughs> to start coming you know, and it's terrible. It's like really so much yeah. work to maintain muscle now. So that's for me is to keep the book moving along. And maybe I need to set a rule that for every day that I am willing to write that book, I mm -hmm. need to move my body. You know, I need to right. pair those two habits because what's the point being dedicated to the book and being sick when I need to launch it, right? That's so. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that you're writing. I, I, I think I, I had forgotten to ask you about that, but I remember... I, I saw somewhere that you mentioned that that was uh, your your project project you were working on, and I'm so happy. And again, I'm hoping that um, it'll reach a lot of people, uh, and particularly a lot of people don't realize that you know people from South Asia and places like that their their risk of heart disease is um, worse than probably any other culture. And when you so we need uh, people that are relatable. Uh, that is that's spreading this message and 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 we never want to we want to honor our culture uh while honoring the need to be here for our friends and family so there's always a way to tweak it there's always a low carb or keto alternative that we can put in front of people and i just appreciate you so so as we wrap up um what's the best way for people to find you if they want to learn about the work you're doing Oh, thank you. So I'm on LinkedIn. So it's Roshni Sangani, R-O-S-H-A-N-I Sangani. I guess we can probably put links or something. Yeah. And I'm on Instagram with that same name. And I also have our own website, which is Raysan Health. So that's R-E-I-S-A-A-N health.com. All right, Dr. Uh, uh, Rashani, let's go with your, yeah, Rash we'll go with your first name. Listen, um, I am so happy we finally connected. Uh, and literally, it was just you commenting on a LinkedIn post. I think it was the food pharmacy, right? And you were yes. uh, celebrating. That. I was like, "Who is this? Uh, who is this lady?" <laughs> you know. And then I was like, "Wait a minute! I had seen you. Uh, I had. I hadn't. I don't think I listened to your full episode, but I had seen kind of the diet doctor thing. But I just didn't listen mm -hmm. to it because we're so busy. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna tell you, I was so grateful." to see the connection and, 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 and the fact that you spent so much time with me, I want to say that publicly, you know, to record a podcast and four video shorts guys, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to get an endocrinologist in front of you guys who would, you know, share messages of healing that sometimes it's nice to have uh, a specialist whose job is to, you know, deal with hormonal diseases because that builds a little credibility, just like having a Dr. Brett Scher, uh, talk about heart stuff in a metabolic appropriate manner. So thank you so much for joining us today. I look forward to working in the future with you. And uh, I hope you have a great day. And thank you so much for being on the podcast.
Thank you for everything you do for your community. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So guys, you know, um, I looked up um, the number of physicians in the U.S. It was a, a million uh, 77,115. Of course, these are approximates. And then in India, it was about 1.2 million. Now imagine if we could train just 10%, I'm not greedy. If we could train 10% to focus on treating their patients with a focus on lifestyle as the primary modality, what would the world look like, guys? Uh, I think I know the answer. It would be a world with less illness. It would be a world... Uh, where there's less need for chronic medications. Uh, it would be a world where less procedures and surgeries are done. And, and, and there would be more people on the planet living longer lives, but not just longer, but a life where the quality of their life is so much better. And who wouldn't want that for their friends and family? So, so as we wrap up this ex episode, I want to you know, I want each and every one of you to, to know that our destiny is to do just that. Our destiny is to heal and to bring this message to the masses. So, and I believe this because we have doctors like my good friend who joined us today. So, so if you want to be part of this journey, share episodes of metabolic healing, not just this episode, not just, you know, Dr. Hampton and share other people with your friends and family who are spreading this message like Dr. Eric Westman and others. So, and even better, if you're motivated and you've had some things happen in your life, then maybe you should start a YouTube channel or podcast. There's not enough evangelists out there spreading this message. So I would love to see that happen. I want to do a shout out again to Dr. Uh, not Dr. I call him Dr. But a carry of the Homestead How uh, YouTube channel because he's trying to raise the funds to support a carnivore documentary so we can at least balance the uh, discussions uh, compared to maybe the blue zones, for example. And we want to do that as well. So so I really appreciate you guys, you know, investing in yourself, taking the time to learn how to heal, you know, while you're kind of maybe cooking, got this in the background, whatever you're doing, driving to work, you're listening in. Uh, I'm just happy that you're focused on your health. And I hope you continue to do that. And what we promise is we'll continue to do the work we're doing. So, so thank you for coming to this episode of the Protecting Your Nest podcast. And until the next episode, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest. And thanks again, Doc, for joining me. Thank you, Tony. You've been listening to Protecting Your Nest with Dr. Tony Hampton. For more, visit drtonyhampton.com.